Thank you, Dr. McCall, for this introduction. And thank you for your being here, all of you. Uh, Dr. Van Hooser referred to the group as the faithful remnant, <laughs> the group in this hall. I chose as my epigraph verse, a verse in the book of Isaiah, chapter 5, verse 20. Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Before we start on our exploration tour, we have better get a trustworthy map of the seas we are to sail. The metaphor of circumnavigation has a high pedigree since it is found already in Plato's Phaedo. <laughs> we must have an idea, at least, of the areas we are to survey. As we wish to ascertain the relationship between evil and possibility, under and before the biblical God, we have better clarify what we mean by evil. And the prophet's solemn warning, which I just read, reminds us that we are not just having fun with concepts. Woe to those who confuse categorization, who, for instance, claim the right to define the right by themselves as they please, who, or who subvert God-given scales through paradoxes and dialectics. There are some, as you know, and we wish to avoid their company our hope and resolute oath of obedience to our Lord of Allegiance, to our Captain, is that we shall follow his word in every matter. A common introduction on what we should mean by evil opens with Leibniz's typology. Metaphysical evil, which was the foundational form of evil in his analysis, from which the others derive. Physical evil, which basically means suffering. And moral evil, roughly what theologians would call sin. I prefer a slower and maybe a more cautious approach, not to start with this threefold division, we shall come to it, but with a more impressionistic approach, uh, trying to see in a non-arbitrary manner what roughly at least people call evil, to have an idea uh, before we analyze the things more precisely from the Bible. But this impressionistic start is also referred to the Bible. I think that formal de de definition in the manner of geometry would yield only a semblance of rigor. But we don't speak in a vacuum, and so we start with language about evil. Everybody, everywhere, applies to aspects or elements of human experience terms which we may translate or paraphrase evil in all languages, and also in Biblical Hebrew and Greek, there are words for bad contrasted with good, for wrong contrasted to right, for failure, for pain and disease, for grief, for crime, for wickedness, for betrayal, frustration, misfortune, vanity. Themes associated with such terms with more or less literal links are those of disorder, of fear, often despair, and also ruin, death, uncleanness. 
Paul Ricoeur's study, which was already mentioned last night in the first part of his book, the Symbolism of Evil, starts with the symbol of stain, which makes one unclean. He considered this as the primary datum. Darkness also is a frequent symbol. As you know, it, it, it is found in the verse in Isaiah I just read. It, in, in fact, it is found elsewhere in the same book. And it is typical in the New Testament of the Johannine writings, darkness opposed to, to light. Fear is very often the fear of judgment, the fear of God's wrath, although fearlessness in regard of that divine judgment is also a form that is castigated. That means a degree of hardening in sinfulness, in evil. Of course, I know that uh, we cannot draw conclusions for mere vocabulary, and we must be uh, extremely cautious when dealing with etymology. Etymology is very often dubious, <laughs> but in any case, it does not uh, rule the meaning uh, of terms. Truth claims, we know, at attached to propositions, to words put to use. And whatever language may be beyond instrumentality, I maintain that it is also an instrument. But vocabulary, individual words, are still framed in the, forged in the service of human exchanges uh, of words. And so in vocabulary, we get a kind of mirror of predominant uses of the same words. Uh, I'm told that Eskimo languages possess dozens of different words for snow. <laughs> and I suspect that Kalahari net natives have much fewer <laughs> such words. You see. Uh, it, it reflects uh, actual experience, what we find in vocabulary. In a dictionary, nothing magic about it, is nothing else than a summary recollection of what people have said with the words. And it recalls for us their denotations and connotations. Therefore, I affirm uh, that we can observe vocabulary used in connection with the experience of evil and draw already some lessons uh, from it. And in, uh, from this viewpoint, I am struck by the sheer abundance of words for evil, especially for sin, in Biblical Hebrew. Biblical Hebrew, and this is one reason why I would say to my students in days past that Hebrew is an easy language, <laughs> has a very restricted vocabulary globally, at least what we know uh, of Biblical Hebrew. But for evil and sin, it is extremely abundant. <laughs> and so I think it, this uh, should attract our uh, attention. It shows a special interest in evil and its contours. The contours which emerge from the variegated mass and maze of unreflective expression and interchange, especially biblical, from the tapestry of the biblical discourses, I think could be summarized under four heads. Correlation, kinship, yet elusiveness, and singularity. And I will develop uh, these four points. Correlation. Evil is what ought not to be. What one should avoid, what uh, uh, is the correlate uh, of disgust, uh, of shame, of remorse, of indignation. It is the object of lament and accusation. This is the correlation I point to. Evil is located uh, in a constitutive relationship to what ought to be, uh, to some kind of norm. Jean Nabert, 
who was a French philosopher who greatly influenced, especially on evil, Paul Ricoeur, found the nucleus of the notion or feeling of evil as the unjustifiable. Evil is what cannot be justified. And you say, no, you are indicted or ashamed. As such, I note, evil is a second. It presupposes some standard of the right and of harmony, what ought to be there and isn't. Some good, absent or violated. I know some people have denied this, very few in, actually. Uh, there is a, a writer whom I esteem in France, André Glucksmann, one of the, those Marxists of the 60s who changed radically in the 70s and became an effective uh, critic of Marxism, basically because of his reaction to Marxism, I think. Uh, he pleads that what is first is the consciousness of evil, <laughs> that uh, we should rather define good uh, by its contrast with evil than the reverse. <laughs> the reason why I think he, his motive, the reason why he thus uh, argues is because he has seen the disasters uh, when ideologies that proclaim that they know the good <laughs> and I, that they know the way uh, to establish the good have what, what the disasters they have produced, Marxism being one case in point. Uh, but I read him I don't find him convincing. I still maintain that there is a correlation with a norm of the right of the good and then uh, evil defined by his departure from the same. Kinship. The kinship I'm speaking of is the kinship with negation. So it is very close to what I just said. Uh, applied to prior goodness, evil is characterized by negation. It is no good. <laughs> Blindness is the loss of or lack of sight, and so on. Many key terms in many languages, and I, I think it is especially true of New Testament uh, Greek. Many terms are built with prefixes or suffixes of negation. And I'm giving examples in English, as I know them, but it's quite clear. Unjust, injustice, misdeed, misfortune, deviation, abnormal, abuse, apostasy, pitiless, godless. You see, all these terms show that there is a moment of negation in the way the concept is construed. Gesenius, the 19th century founder of modern Hebrew studies, Gesenius made a rapprochement between awen, the Hebrew term for fraud, for sometimes for vanity, sometimes even for, for, for crime, uh, and the particle ayin, the particle that is used uh, to mean there is not, absence of. <laughs> I know that today linguistic experts would not follow that supposed etymology, <laughs> but it may serve as an illustration, <laughs> as a symbol of that uh, kinship between evil and what is negative. This Kinship is also uh, illustrated by the choice Karl Barth made of a word for the power opposed to God in his Church Dogmatics, as you may know. It's very difficult to translate into English. There is a footnote in the translation that translators hesitated a lot before they chose nothingness, das Nichtige. Uh, so was it a negative? Uh, was it no, nothingness? Well, they finally chose nothingness. But again, it, it is an illustration of that kinship uh, I am highlighting. Elusiveness. 
as the third uh, key uh, concept. The emphasis on negation leaves many unsatisfied, and I think they are uh, warranted <laughs> in their insatisfaction. It does not match, if you stress negation, it doesn't match the sense of a reality which we meet in the world. It's not the mere absence of the good, but a power at war with God and at war with God's image in humankind. Evil, writes George Florovsky. George Florovsky taught for a number of years, an orthodox theologian in Paris, but then he moved to Harvard. He, was a, he had a chair in, in Harvard. I was privileged when I was young to be a speaker in, in the same theological students' conference uh, in which he, he had accepted to be invited. The, or let me explain it a little. We are a small group. <laughs> uh, uh, Harold O.J. Brown, who was, I think, a professor at Trinity, had uh, George Florovsky as his doctor father. See? So there was a personal connection. And Harold O.J. Brown uh, was the theological secretary for IFES at that time. And so he could invite <laughs> George Florovsky and uh, George Florovsky uh, came to this gathering, and I remember we were together there. So George Florovsky stresses that evil is productive in its destructiveness. Sin, evil, he says, may show something like genius. There is a genius in evil doing. And this is an emphasis which we find in other great thinkers, Schelling, whom I already mentioned yesterday, and also Kierkegaard, strongly plead that evil is also a position. It is a negation and a position. And the stain of sin, this is a thought which I think we find in Ricoeur, is no, but the metaphor is mine, is <laughs> not a mere hole. <laughs> in the tissue and texture of creation. In a way, it adds something. See? A stain adds something. Ricoeur aptly offers two phrases that uh, tell of this elusiveness uh, of evil. He says, quasi-being and quasi-non-being, both together. He also says that it is an infection which is defection. Uh, sin is a position at the same time. Uh, and this points to the elusiveness of the concept of evil. Actually, it is not even a concept. This is why I say quasi-concept uh, in my title, uh, using this quasi, which Ricard also uh, uses. Concepts are made to grasp the, the natures, the essences, the, the, uh, the, the properties and qualities uh, that go together according to God's creation. And evil being the alien, again my theme, <laughs> you don't reach to evil with a clear concept. It is the unjustifiable. You, you can, you can only speak of it negatively uh, in a way that uh, is not metaphorical. Otherwise, you have metaphors and you, you, you can reach to it uh, in an oblique way, oblique fashion. Plato had already said of matter in the Timaeus uh, that it cannot be grasped and penetrated by reason. Matter is the irrational uh, factor. And so he said we can only approach its enigmatic status obliquely through a bastard reasoning. <laughs> Nothologismo. <laughs> and it is interesting, I think, that uh, Plotinus quotes this phrase from Plato when he deals with matter as evil, as non-being an evil, uh, as I told you briefly yesterday, uh, 
And it is again found in Schelling. Schelling also remembers that uh, typical phrase uh, which tells of the elusiveness of evil. And then singularity. In this elusiveness for conceptual thought, evil cannot share the status of created reality. It is a part, singular. Even the phrase, the Latin phrase, sui generis, I pronounce la Latin with the so-called restituted pronunciation. Sui generis is not uh, really uh, adequate because there is no genus, <laughs> genus if you prefer, no genus uh, just as God, no nest in genere, there is no genus for deity, there is only one God. There is no genus for evil, either, because uh, genera belong to creation, <laughs> uh, belong to the harmony uh, God established through his logos. So uh, we cannot even say sui generis, it is totally singular. And this is expressed in scripture by the unique disjunction of the origin of being, Genesis 1 and 2, and the introduction of evil, Genesis 3. It is unique among reconstructions of origin, which we find in the myth of many people or in philosophies. And this, Ricoeur very ably uh, showed, though he didn't remain faithful to the end, to this remarkable insight. The singularity of evil. And though it is not part of creation, it encounters us in the world God has created with a heavy weight of reality, opposition to God. Anselm Cantabri uh, refrain, you know, in the Cur Deus Homo, is, you have not yet considered of what weight is sin. Conti ponderis es peccato. The weight of sin, this is a biblical teaching indeed. The reality of sin manifests itself in judgment. It manifests itself in the need of redemption and in the price paid for redemption. It is such a great salvation in the words of Hebrews. And also it manifests itself in the existence of the evil one, the God of this world. This is a title which is used once in the New Testament. So you see, the quasi-concept, whose metaphorical roots are still apparent, can only be expressed with a, a, a set of various metaphors. And this Augustine, again, uh, brought to light uh, in, in a felicitous manner corruption. Evil is not something, it has no being, but it has a reality, that of corruption, perversion, twisting. This is the way in which it encounters us, it, it wounds us, it hurts us, and it seduces us. The reality uh, of this perversion, a parasitic character, always attracted to created goodness, but always in a way that corrupts that goodness. And the weight and the force of evil seems to that of the created being, it perverts. This is the weight or the substance it borrows, or rather it steals, it misuses, and deviates. Having gathered these elements from uh, the data that are available, then I now ask the question of, about metaphysical evil. Leibniz, with characteristic calm and courtesy, establishes metaphysical evil as the basis of his theodicy. He reasons that evil is the absence of good, which will be granted by many. 
and God alone, the monad, the central and supreme monad, God is perfectly good. All possible worlds include a diversity of beings. And if there is a diversity of beings, then there is inequality among them. And inevitably, there are some that are better than others, and therefore some that are worse than others. Evil pertains necessarily to any possible world, and this is independent of God's will. He stresses the point very, very often, and the source of all evil that we may uh, designate uh, and experience, uh, this belongs to God's essence as part of his mind, of his intelligence. Uh, all these possible worlds are there, and they necessarily include evil. What he adds, is that uh, God's goodness makes an obligation, <laughs> produces an obligation for God to choose the best possible world. And therefore, we must trust God that the world in which we are is the best of all these possible worlds. But evil is found in that possibility uh, already in the essences that belong to God's own essence. The imperfection of finite being, as such, explains, he, he says very clearly, he shows this example, Judas' betrayal. This is part of a possible world, and uh, it is before God has decided anything. Uh, God decides that this world will be better than all the others, uh, which includes Judas' betrayal, uh, but but Judas' betrayal was there in that possible world uh, before that. Thomists have promptly pointed to the weakness, even categorical mistake, in Leibniz's theory. And they replied, I think, uh, with good uh, ground for that, evil is not any absence of a given good, but the absence of a good that was due the loss of one eye for a human person is evil because uh, what was due to the human nature <laughs> was having two eyes. But not having a third one is no evil uh, because this is not part of human nature. This is the Thomistic reasoning in this. In other terms, Leibniz intolerably equates evil and finiteness. And this is calling the good creation of God evil, to recall the words of the prophet. Schelling also shows that Leibniz cannot maintain his merely negative view of evil, and that his comparison with the inertia in physics, uh, the inertia of the boat uh, on, on the river, for instance, <coughs> is inadequate. There is an analysis in Schelling, which is worth reading. But Schelling himself roots evil also in metaphysics. <laughs> he has metaphysical evil in uh, the depth uh, of divine life, as I briefly said yesterday. Uh, he borrows from Burme the, uh, the key German terms, Urgrund, the bottom, the primordial bottom. <laughs> Uh, and ungrund, there is not even a bottom, <laughs> uh, which is the meaning of abyss, <laughs> not even a bottom. Ungrund, Burme had said, and uh, in this depth, uh, abysmal depth, uh, Schelling con considered that there is the possibility of evil. Uh, it, it is there with the uh, uh, virtual antagonism of two tendencies which are separate uh, as soon as man uh, appears as an expression uh, of the divine life. Because there is a clear pantheistic uh, soul or uh, breath in, in, in Schelling's uh, system. <coughs> 
Schelling changed throughout his life. Th this book I'm referring to was published in 1809, and it is a work of his finest maturity, we could say. As to Thomist, however, do they distance themselves enough from Leibniz? Thomas Aquinas does not consider ontological inferiority an evil, but as we said yesterday, it implies fallibility. And beyond that, fallibility implies an actual fall, at least here and there. <laughs> this he says very clearly. I think this looks very much like metaphysical evil. And just as it is in, in Leibniz and many, uh, and in Plotinus, uh, uh, what uh, ransoms, if, if, if you like, uh, this presence of evil in, in the very being of creation is the work of redemption, is the greater good that God achieves through this presence uh, of evil. Redemption is, is the second aspect. The first aspect is the beauty of the world. Uh, uh, with all those dissonances, just as a, a, a symphony will be more beautiful because of some dissonances, uh, evil here and there is a factor of the beauty of the whole. But then, furthermore, it is the basis for redemption or a promotion of creature, of the human creature, to deified status. So a much greater good. This is the justification. St. Thomas is fond of a triad which embraces all three levels of corruption, and in each case, in his view, ransomed by the greater good thereby obtaining. He says, the corruption of the air when you uh, make a fire. This is an evil for the oxygen of the air. He doesn't speak of oxygen, but he says the air. The air is corrupted. So, you see, uh, it is inevitable that such a corruption happens, but <coughs> the greater good is that you have a fire. Then the death of the donkey, a lion divorce. This is evil for the donkey, but it is good for the whole food chain, the whole harmony of animal life. And then the persecution of a martyr by enemies of the faith, which enables this martyr to gain merit, which glorifies God. He uses these three illustrations in a row as uh, application of the same principle of the greater good. Modern Thomists, such as Gilson and Maritain, have tried to separate moral evil from the two other kinds, but I found quotations that show that they are unable, finally, to separate uh, between these two. They uh, finally fall into their patron's, St. Thomas, <laughs> logic. Thinkers who locate evil in being, as in the very constitution of reality, uh, may do so with varying degrees of emotion. They may variously appreciate the evilness of that evil. And then they may proclaim the final overcoming of that evil with more or less triumphant flourish. Evil looks minimal in Leibniz's eyes. So it hardly needs to be overcome. <laughs> uh, hence, Leibniz's system is considered as the very model of optimism. One may suspect that this outward optimism overcompensates a deeply hidden and repressed anxiety. <laughs> but of course, he never uh, was conscious himself. He had repressed this. Uh, deep dread, which is typically modern. We, should, we um, excuse me, I must find my... Thomism takes evil more seriously, but still sounds optimistic. Tragic uh, 
thinkers take evil more seriously. At least they seem to be so, unless they reverse the picture with the certainty of the final defeat of evil and even affirming the fruitfulness of evil. Ricoeur has defined tragedy in this way. Quote, sin and existence are as an undivided whole. Guilt becomes constitutive. Existence is guilty, since it is not being itself. In the symbolism of evil, he characterizes the tragic myth as that of the wicked god, the cruel god who blinds human creatures. Since God is the source of the reality as it is, and, that, and since one finds evil and reality, then we must find the roots of evil in God himself. This is the logic of this tragic view. The great German idealists, heirs of the Sturm und Drang generation, this phrase even comes better in English than in German, storm and stress. <laughs> you have an alliteration that is not in the original. Uh, have so interpreted tragedy. Schelling justifies evil on account uh, of its uh, role for the dynamics of life. Uh, he criticizes other uh, thinkers before him because they have not been sensitive uh, to the power of life affirming, life which requires opposition. And of course, the supreme system is that of Hegel, who was a student with Schelling in the Tübingen Stift, Stift as I said. His system can be characterized as pan-tragic. And there are horrendous descriptions of particular evils. And yet it is totally optimistic. Since for Hegel, the negative is fruitful. It is the mover uh, of the progress of Weltgeschichte. And the history of the world is itself the self-realization of the absolute. And the negative evil plays a positive role in this, he says. You could say of war that it is com to be compared with the winds that cleaned the atmosphere when there were uh, mists of uh, unhealthy character. Uh, wars play a positive role as, as generally the negative. Kierkegaard protested against Hegel passionately. And in a way that we can say uh, cost him his life he died so early, also exhausted and uh, uh, as the target of uh, so much ill will around him and mockery. Yet one may wonder if, whether the preparation of sin in angst, dread, anxiety, uh, which is born of the discordance of finite and infinite. This, he clearly says, does not give, after all, sin a metaphysical root though he stresses, as I said, the leap between possibility and actuality. Karl Barth, who started as a Kierkegaardian, would vehemently protest against the suspicion of metaphysical evil. And the quote I gave you yesterday uh, clearly shows that. And yet, das Nichtige that nothingness. He says it is not created, but it is produced by God's yes to his creation. You have a strange logic that Karl Barth applies. God's yes to his creation implies a no to what is not his creation. And this no produces nothingness, the negative, uh, just by being uh, implicit in God's yes. And this is a power, a power under which we must be defeated, a, a power that casts a shadow on creation. It is not the shadow of creation. It, the shadow is cast by that power, das Nichtige. To me, it sounds quite metaphysical, uh, uh, again. For our purpose, 
Richard's treatment is most interesting. He sees with great per perspicacity that the Eden narrative, he, he calls it the Adamic myth, offers the antithesis of the tragic myth. Precisely, it is bound, it is of one piece with uh, the affirmation of the one good God, moral monotheism. And he clearly sees that the call of the prophets to repentance, uh, the clear charge of guilt, uh, is bound with this uh, historical character of the introduction of evil, uh, contrary to the tragic myth. And yet, and yet he will not follow this logic he has seen in the biblical text any further. He says what we know as modern uh, men uh, about the human origins rules out anything of the kind. We cannot take it historically. So it is a myth. And he has seen so clearly the importance uh, of the historical character of the, of the fall uh, for uh, the Old Testament mind. And, and yet, he tries to preserve as much as he can of it without maintaining the historicity. But he cannot. He preserved as much as he can, but he cannot preserve it truly. And he falls back into the tragic myth. And he, he sees it. He, he clearly says it. He, see, he says the tragic myth, in the end, is invincible. It cannot be defeated. And he sees, as a proof of that, the presence of the serpent in the Eden narrative. He says the presence of the serpent, a principle of evil, uh, created, so in, in that situation, is uh, the residue of the tragic myth which cannot be defeated and eliminated, you see. So I tried to argue against <laughs> this, uh, the thesis of Ricoeur, which is clever. Uh, I think in the uh, ancient Middle East, this would not be the normal understanding of the serpent figure. Uh, the serpent is the figure that he, is also a positive figure. Uh, it, it has the secret of healing. <laughs> it, it knows the secret of the earth. Uh, it is a, a representative of all the heathen cults around. <coughs> uh, it has to do with divination, knowing what others may not know. You see, serpent is nachash in Hebrew. And the verb to practice divination is the verb nachash. You use it mainly in the PL, but uh, you see, it is very, very striking. I think this are the, these are the associations which help us to interpret correctly the role of the serpent. The role of the serpent warns against the seduction of all uh, these magic uh, practices and uh, these polytheistic cults around. It's not the meaning of uh, the tragic myth uh, at all. See? So I th think we are to resist even uh, Ricard's uh, thesis uh, on, on this point. There are other, uh, but I uh, look, yes, I, I must skip uh, one or two paragraphs. There are other attempts, uh, especially with regard to the book of Job, to find some suggestions of metaphysical evil, but I think none of them is convincing. And so I move now to the second sort, physical evil. I deny that there should be anything worth the name metaphysical evil in a biblical perspective. The creation of God is good, perfectly good, superlatively good, tov me'od, me'od at the end of Genesis 1 is the way you express a superlative, one of the ways in Hebrew, and uh, we must stay with this affirmation, this firm of, uh, statement, but physical evil. Under the second rubric, we think basically of suffering or pain, some people make a distinction, I, I don't, between suffering and pain and, and death among sentient creatures. 
Earthquakes, volcano eruptions only count as evil in their painful effects, sometimes lethal effects, on such creatures. I hope you grant me that. Physical evil, as I just defined it, meets clear recognition in scripture. Psalms of lament testify to the poignant consciousness of its abnormality. It shouldn't be there. It is a contrast with stoic denial and resignation. How long, O oh Lord? And Genesis 3 is interested in the etiology of key forms of such evil, toil, childbirth, labor, suffering, death. This, I think, is clearly the meaning of the passage. We do meet in scripture the assumption of the reality of such an evil into a doctrine of soul-making suffering. This is present in scripture. There are hints of this role in Elihu's discourses in the book of Job. And more precisely, the writer to the Hebrews takes up Aeschylus' play on words, emathen, epathen. Emathen, he learned. Epathen, he suffered. Though he was a son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. See, you have a play of words which is, is much uh, anterior to New Testament times with the great playwright Aeschylus. Hardship may be the school of virtue, or in the case of our Lord Jesus, obedience to the Father. But I don't think this is the whole thing about uh, physical evil in, in, in scripture. Uh, it is just one function it may have. What about the rest. Our epoch so stridently concentrates on suffering as the evil that we must make a distinct effort as distancing ourselves. We should check critically our own reactions to the theme of suffering. I may just mention one, one point. Uh, yesterday, the, the subtitle of my book, Evil on the Cross, uh, was uh, mentioned with the word pain. This is not mine. <laughs> uh, in, in the French version, you don't have the word suffering or pain. Uh, it was added by uh, the publisher without <laughs> consulting me. <laughs> so uh, actually, uh, I'm not concentrating at all on pain in, in, in that book. <laughs> this. Biblical theme of pain is present, but we must respect biblical uh, proportions about it. Suffering is not the problem. Otto Piper of Princeton correctly perceived that the godly men and women of scripture are not first preoccupied with pain or pleasure, but with sin before God. It is sin, the prophet stresses, sin only that creates a barrier between God and his people, Isaiah 59. I'm impressed with Psalm 130, De Profundis, from the depth. You, you can see there how the consciousness of sin before God is the problem for the godly Old Testament man. The problem of evil, the problem of evil, I have done. And Kierkegaard highlighted this point very, very strongly in his edifying discourses and also in the very title of his book, Sickness Unto Death. He says, starting with John 11, Lazarus was sick and his sickness was deadly, he died. And yet, Jesus says, this sickness is not unto death. So what is sickness unto death? The only sickness unto death is sin. And he develops in his book a whole uh, typology of sin and sin as despair. Uh, 
as St. Augustine already taught in no uncertain terms, uh, and this has been the classical tenet, moral evil, sin, is the source of physical evil. Every evil, he says, is either sin or the consequence of sin. He, he, there are two quotations where he, he, he says it clearly. Say, the human use and abuse and misuse of freedom generates for humankind in its organic solidarity, all generations together, various forms of physical evil. And this physical evil is both a natural consequence of sin, reaping what humans have sown, this is a biblical metaphor, and a just response of the righteous judge of all the earth. This theologumenon, which I think Genesis 3 strongly supports, appears to many today, I know well, <laughs> the height of extravagance, untenable imagination, even a moral scandal. But I believe we can responsibly defend it. Contemporary sensitivities also compel me to mention a special problem, but I cannot deal with it in any detail, of course. It looms very large in the eyes of many, the problem of animal suffering and death. Nature, red in tooth and claw, the tiger's fear for symmetry, these have grown into major obstacles in the way of faith for not a few people around us. So what should I say? As a young boy, I loved my dog. <laughs> and I could even tell of feats of intelligence on that dog's part. Yet, as a reader of scripture, a cold-blooded reader, as I ought to be, I must tell what I find. There is no hint in scripture that animal death and violence among animals should be seen as evil. Not a syllable. Not that it should be at the consequence of sin, either of human sin or of uh, angelic sin, as Alvin Plantinga uh, still defends. He's very courageous so to do. But uh, I don't see any biblical encouragement to that idea. On the contrary, present behavior in the animal realm, carnivorous animals are the subject of praise they, refer God's, they uh, reflect God's wisdom. Psalm 104, or the Lord's discourses in Job. For animal death, I think it's pretty easy. Why would one consider them, uh, those deaths, as evil? Epicurean arguments are on target here. Not for human death, but you know, they use them for human death. But for animal death, atoms we, which were glued together for a time now dissociate from each other. Why call that evil? The whole ecological system is a masterpiece, and it, it is based uh, on that animal death and, and violence. Why consider evil the fact that 98% of species have disappeared uh, through the history of life? Some writers. Christopher Southgate, and other more recent, even more recently, uh, consider this evil. Why? Why could we not admit that God created such a species for a time and not for eternity? See, uh, this uh, is to me part of a, a pretty uh, obvious, well uh, conformed to common sense. I find it really ludicrous at times. Uh, Richard Swinburne, uh, a man worthy of all respect, uh, uh, considers as an evil, a uh, very serious evil, the, uh, all the victims of the carnivorous dinosaurs. But since he defends a greater good, theodicy, he tries to argue that the moral feelings, that uh, uh, the knowledge of these uh, actions of the dinosaurs produce in us uh, is the greater good <laughs> that ransoms uh, this evil. 
frankly, with all the empathy I can, I, um, I only smile. <laughs> Animal suffering is a much more difficult problem. Uh, and in, for this, I just mentioned there are two texts that seem to go opposite ways in scripture, and we have to meditate. I may not enlarge now uh, on this. Uh, there is the passage in Proverbs 12 about the wicked man who treats uh, his animals uh, with cruelty. Mm -hmm. So this seems to show that there is a concern uh, for animal well-being. But also the passage in 1 Corinthians 9.9 9, uh, where Paul explains the rule about oxen uh, not forbidden to, to eat. Uh, and Paul says, does God care for oxen? No, <laughs> have the man <laughs> that shows clearly that to, to him, the answer is, is no. Uh, I suggest two things, and I leave it uh, at, this, at this point, two things. Uh, first, uh, the problem is that of a anthropological projection. When we are uh, greatly bothered by animal suffering, it is on the basis of the link we have developed. And we uh, imagine uh, a suffering or a sensitivity comparable to ours in those animals. I think this anthropological projection uh, is based on the solidarity between the animal realm and humankind, uh, both creatures uh, of the sixth day, uh, Yet, it is a projection, and we cannot affirm that it corresponds to reality. As C.S. Lewis stressed, apparently there is no I <laughs> to speak in the first person singular in, in animals, even those most developed. Second remark, there is a mystery of animal life. Traits in animal life that seem to have their meaning only when they are fully blown uh, in human life. They anticipate on what is found in humans, but otherwise you could not understand why God has gifted them in this way. And I've, I, I cannot read full quotation because of time, but I have an unexpected ally on this, Karl Marx. <laughs> Karl Marx says that virtualities in species that announce traits which are found in higher species uh, uh, are uh, only understood when the higher species is there. <laughs> he, he says so. He says so because it apply, he applies it to economic systems after, after having said that in the introduction to his critique of political economy. But it is an interesting quotation. And then moral evil, capital evil, evil radically evil. The misuse of creational privilege, the breaking of God's command, the betrayal of the covenant. First remark, it is not metaphysical. It is not rooted in the creational makeup uh, of humankind. But inevitably, it has a relationship with uh, that being God has given man. Evil or uh, sin reverses the order. It uses the gift God has made to humankind in order to rob God of the honor which is due to him, but it is God's image which is made the point of reference the center, uh, and in a way, the, the idol. So you see, it has a relationship with uh, the metaphysical situation uh, of humankind. And then, as soon as the positive relationship <coughs> is broken with God, since the you know, human creature is God's image, it has effects, deteriorating uh, effects, uh, on the very being of man. I think we must say that uh, humans remain God's images, but now caricatures 
done caricatures. Moral evil in, is the act in the broader sense, commission and omission. It is first inward, it flows from the heart, as Jesus stressed, Matthew 15 and parallels, but it expresses itself outwardly. And one very important biblical theme regarding that moral evil is the entailment of guilt. Guilt is the measure of the act in its relationship to God, Koram Deo in the covenant framework. And then there is a subtle distinction that has been the subject of discussion among theologians. There are two levels of guilt. Usually they are uh, referred to with Latin phrases, reatus, guilt, corpae, and reatus, poenae. The reatus culpae, Turretin prefers another phrase, is the, the, the simple fact that the act was committed. It is, as it were, the registration of that act. Whereas reatus poenae is the debt incurred towards the demand of justice and the obligation to satisfy the demand of justice. It corresponds to the boomerang of the spiritual order of holy righteousness. Normally, these two go together. Reatus culpae, I have done that. I have now only demerit. Uh, uh, I can claim, and this remains forever. And Paul says, I am the first of sinners. I persecuted God's church. Uh, th this demerit remains. But then there is the depth to justice. Something uh, a guilty person has to bear, according to the expression in the Old Testament. And here intervenes the miracle of our head's substitution. Christ bore our sins in our stead. It is clear that he didn't commit them. Uh, and uh, he, his glory of uh, the sinless uh, person is perfectly preserved. But he paid the price. He uh, paid the debt to justice. There is still a final question on moral evil, but uh, I summarize. <laughs> that uh, would be worth considering more at leisure. <laughs> it is the issue of malignancy uh, of evil and sin. It is an axiom for the Greek philosophers, for Augustine, for Thomas Aquinas, for many, many who have followed him until this day, that man can only will, desire what is good or what he thinks, or her, she thinks, is good. And therefore, the choice of evil corresponds to, or always to an error. Uh, evil is committed under the guise of a good. I have a twisted view uh, of the reality of values, and so I think it will be good for me. Actually, it is evil. This is uh, almost as an axiom. And Thomas Aquinas even criticized the Talmud in one passage because the Talmud says otherwise. <laughs> but others have said no. And I'm tempted to say, no, there is a depth of malignancy in, in sin that cannot be simply explained in this way. Sure, sin deceives us by a lying appearance. At the same time, I am quite sure that at bottom there is the hatred of God, a, a, a rage uh, against him and his right over us. Uh, there is a, a denial uh, of the bond that binds us to him as our creator. I think there is a deeper malignancy in sin.
than the tradition usually has admitted. How is this possible? Well, we'll try to investigate the notion of the possible uh, in the next lectures.